Good morning. Uh, thank you, Ji Jun, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm deeply honored to be the speaker of this year's CEDA Distinguished Speaker Luncheon at DAC. Now, I would like to share with you all an exciting journey that my group has taken on the path of in-memory computing, especially from a cross-layer perspective, from emerging memory devices to applications. Now, as we all know, we are facing a really serious data deluge. It has been estimated that by 2030, globally, over 600 zettabytes of data will be generated, and the number will keep increasing exponentially. Now, many applications, uh, for example, machine learning, bioinformatics, etc., contributes to this data explosion. Now, what makes this even worse is that 80% of all the data are unstructured. And thus, they lack a temporal or spatial locality. Hence, they cannot readily take advantage of many advanced architectural techniques. So what is the cost of processing such data? Now, according to the decadal plan published by Semiconductor Research Corporation in 2021, energy due to data processing grows exponentially and doubles about every, doubles about every three years. However, the world's energy production only grows linearly. So if this trend continues after 2030, the energy consumption consumed by this information processing will actually be limited by the market dynamics. Now, a somewhat pessimistic projection have indicated that by 2030, 20% of our world electricity will be consumed by information and communication technology. So when we think about processing these data using Van Neumann architectures, well, as we all know, uh, it, and especially for unstructured uh, irregular data, we all know that the major bottleneck is the memory wall. And that is that data movement from memory to compute units can be 10 times to 1,000 times more expensive than computation itself in terms of uh, latency, throughput, and energy. Now, data movement also raises more security and privacy concerns. Now, to overcome this problem, uh, many emerging non-volatile memory technologies such as uh, STT MRAM, SOT MRAM, FerroFez RAM, et cetera, et cetera, have been explored. Now, these devices do help the energy overhead, but the data movement is still a major source of energy um, and latency cost. So how to reduce this memory transfer overhead? Now, one way is through a new computational paradigm or architectural paradigm is called in-memory computing. It, this in-memory computing has been attracting lots of attention. Now with in-memory computing, the computation now is done inside the memory components. It could either be in the memory array itself or at the array peripheral. Now they can implement various type of operations uh, based on different type of circuit designs, such as um, uh, and or you know, bitwise logic, you know, arithmetic operations, search operations, etc. Now, with these uh, emerging technologies, it further helps uh, implementing these type of in-memory computing components. Now, in-memory computing not only reduces data transfer, but also can provide a massive parallelism, which is very desirable. So here I show a few representative uh, IMC core examples. Uh, the first one is a DRAM-based bitwise logic engine where two or three words are activated to achieve bit-by-bit -bit logic operations. Uh, another example is an SRAM-based bit serial ALU engine. And here the computation is done on the memory bit lines. Uh, another example is a widely studied resistive memory-based crossbar uh, structure for matrix vector multiplications. Uh, here's one more example that's using STT MRAM for logic, comp for logic computation. Now here, the, again, the computation is done uh, between the activated memory words bit by bit, similar to the in DRAM uh, logic engine. 
The last example is the ferrofed-based associative memory for nearest neighbor search. Now, given all these different in-memory computing cores, the different technologies, et cetera, you can see that the design space can be really large. So now when designing IMC fabrics, we are faced with many choices. From a bottom-up perspective, starting from the choice of memory devices to circuits, to architectures and all the way to algorithms and applications. And decisions made at the lower level could impact the choices at the upper level. However, it is also very important to examine the problem from a top-down perspective, now, depending on the application level requirements, such as energy or performance, one may choose one architecture or one device over the other. Now, application needs can also help shape the design target for lower level components. Now, in the rest of the talk, I will use one type of in-memory computing core and one memory technology that is ferrofed-based associative memory to illustrate how the devices at different levels, inter how the choices at different levels uh, can interact with each other and how cross-layer design can really help in achieving the best results. So why focus, uh, why talk about search? And we all know search appears in lots and lots and lots of applications, right? I just list some of them. And there's some more that you typically don't think they relate to search, but they, can, they actually also inside, they use some search algorithms. So uh, what is associative memory? So associative memory also called content addressable memory, and they basically can support really efficient parallel search. And they are belong to the type that these processing elements is right inside the memory cell. So I'll give you a simple example. Here's a very popular called binary camps or binary associative memory. Here, all the data stored are binary data. A query is also binary. And what this CAM support uh, can do is, in one shot, in a single step, I'm going to compare my query with all the data inside the memory, and then we'll pick out the ones that matches exactly with my query. So you see how efficient. So basically, instead of doing linear, now I got all one type of search complexity. There's also ternary types, and that's basically, besides one and zero, I also store what we call don't cares, okay? And here, don't care will basically match to anything. You know, match to one, match to zero. And then, again, you do the parallel comparison and you pick out the lines that do have the match. Okay? So probably some of us already learned all this stuff even in undergrad days. So what's so good? Why do you pick this up again? Now, of course, the, uh, these type of content addressable memory have been used pretty widely in associative caches, high associativity caches, and network routers, et cetera. But recently, there's growing interest on using them, exploiting them in data analytics, and machine learning, and vector processing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, why this hasn't been so popular before? That's because in building these in CMOS, it's firstly, it's not compact, it's pretty big area. And secondly, it can be very power hungry. So there, the emerging technology, memory technologies I just mentioned will come really handy. They give us really exciting new directions to actually design compact, energy efficient content addressable memories. So now let's go back to the bottom, like devices, right? How does these devices going to help? So I'm going to use, again, the Ferrofax, like I mentioned to you before. Now, what is Ferrofax? It's a relatively new device. It's just, I think it came out um, probably more attention, start get, people start paying them more attention, probably about 10, eight years ago, even shorter than that. Now, what it is is actually the concept is quite simple. They make, we have our, if you realize from your undergrad days, here's our basic uh, CMOS uh, or MOSFETs. Now, what's different here is uh, the, in the gate stack of the MOSFETs, we're going to add a ferroelectric layer called, you know, these ferroelectrics have this unique property of being non-volatile. Okay? Now, by tuning the thickness of this ferroelectric layer, I can actually get different type of devices. And it turned out that if I make the right thickness, I can get a nice hysteresis loop like what I've showed you here. And this will basically forms the fundamental 
building block for memory. And the nice thing is it is CMOS compatible, and like I said, it is non-volatile. Now, there's lots and lots of research, lots of interest from both the industry and the research area, especially from the industry, actually. Our, our, you know, my research is sponsored by, by SRC, uh, companies like Intel, Samsung, Global Foundries, they put in lots of money, lots of research on this device. And I, what I show here is actually Global Foundries uh, 28 nanometer high K metal gate ferrofat chip that has lots and lots of these different sizes of ferrofats on this particular chip. So that's really a very interesting device. So if I just give you a little more primer of what is, how does this device works, it's basically a transistor, put in a little blue bar so you know, remember that's non-volatile. And we basically can program it, we call it, we program, uh, when we first program to make it into the lowest state, what we call it, and then we use different voltages to set the threshold. So basically by writing, I'm changing the threshold voltage of my transistor. When you change the threshold, as we all know, then we change the current, the behavior of the transistors, right? So that's how we can get these, uh, let's say for example, if I use different programming voltages, I can get two distinct states, right? This is uh, state zero, this will be state one. Now, we, if we, the device is large enough, I can even get these multiple states, distinct multiple states. So each state, of course, represents one memory state, right? I can even remember multiple states. Now, another advantage of these type of uh, devices is it has I, high I on, I off because it leverages the CMOS uh, fat, MOSFET uh, characteristic. And this also has three terminals. One device that can control this uh, gate by controlling the gate, I basically have this access control right away in one device. So one device, in a sense, I can use it as a memory, and I can also use it as a logic device. Okay? So it's a very, very interesting device. Uh, now, so this device is so good, what can we use it for? Of course, immediately, because it's non-volatility, we can, of course, use it to build memory, right? without thinking about it. But can we do something even better than that? And that's what I'm going to tell you. So I, I discussed with you before about this content addressable memory. So I'm just redrawing it here, almost the same thing. I'm using the TCAM as an example. And here I'm going to call it exact match. What I mean is if I have a query here, only those rows or words, whatever you call it, that exactly match the query, I'm going to output them as match. The other ones will say not matching. Now, if I use a trans uh, CMOS to build it, each of these cells typically takes tw tw uh, 16 transistors. There's some 12 transistor designs, but they're a lot more complicated in terms of controlling. So what my group had come up is uh, we built a two transistor ferrofat based content addressable memory. Okay. Now, this two transistor basically, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but you, just like in most of the other content addressable memory, it works by pre-charge the match line. And then, you, when, what, well, first you should, of course, store the data inside the cell. And then you pre-charge the match line. Then you apply the queries on these gates. And depending on whether it has a match or not, if there's match, there's no discharge current. Neither of the transistors will be turned on, and the match line stays the one. If you have a mismatch, any type of mismatch, one of these transistors or both of these transistors is going to become turning on, and you have a large discharge current, then your match line becomes zero. So now you're basically using this to get the uh, comparison. So if you look at a bunch of them together, then you see that as long as you have even one cell mismatch, that whole match line can get discharged. That's how you get your comparison in one shot, right? So again, all the input or queries will come in on the column lines and the match lines and horizontal ones that gave you whether it's match or not match. Okay. So it's very compact and it's also low leakage. And just two devices, this particular design does need a pre-charge phase. And we also have a design that using one, trans one, one MOSFET and one ferrofat, which do not need the pre-charge, but it does need a little more complicated sensing circuits. Now there are other designs, like I told you, uh, based on CMOS, based on PCM phase change memories, resistive memories, MTJs, and even flash. Okay. 
And you know, if you're interested later on, I can, I can discuss offline that what is the comparison between them. But for now, I'm just going to tell you this is the, uh, all the capabilities of Fairfax. Now, I just gave you the example of exact match and using two transistors. Now, it turned out that sometimes it's very useful to do what we call the best match. What do you mean by best match? Uh, maybe sometimes none of the cell, none of the words matches. But it would be nice to pick out the words that match it, that match the query closest. And that's what best match does. Pick the row, pick the row that has the most matching cells. Okay. And there's also a threshold match. And in this case, I basically set, set a threshold. Any rows that has the distance from the query less than the threshold will consider to be a match. And it turned out, if I just use this simple design I have here, it can do all of these different type of matches. And of course, where's the trick? The trick is in the sensing circuit. So sensing circuit, you know, depending on what type of matches you need, you have to design the sensing circuit a little more differently, and that's how, where does co-design? Remember I talk about device and circuit, so this is where the circuit comes in as very important component to achieve these functionality. Uh, so uh, now, remember that I talk about besides the two state, you know, what I had before, just binary. Actually, lots of these devices, you know, including um, Ferrofats, they can have multiple states. So I show, uh, again, another Ferrofats that having multiple states, even analog states, right? So the question is, can you use these to build more than just TCAM? And the answer is yes. And so our group has, again, used the same type of same circuit cell, memory cell, and we designed what is called analog content addressable memory. So what does analog content addressable memory do? Basically, each cell defines a range. So if you look at this cell, it defines a voltage range of 0.3 and 0.9. So each cell, I pre-write them in a certain way to define a range. Then query comes in at single value, and if, if your query is within the range, then we'll have very small discharge current. But if the query is much, uh, if the query is outside the range, for example, here, query is outside the range for this cell, then we'll have a large discharge current. So now, again, you pre-charge a match line, and for those, for those lines or for those words that has no has everything matches with the query, or the query is inside the range, then you have a match. And if not, then you have a mismatch. So now I can actually do what I call it a range-based search. Okay? And this type of search is actually very useful in certain type of applications. So uh, our group, uh, in uh, collaboration with my, research, uh, with my colleagues in uh, the device area, we have actually demonstrated this analog content addressable memory concept. And now, one challenge here is all these devices, if you try to make them into multiple states or analog states, they have variations, stochastic variations. So that actually makes these analog cams not as easy as the T cams. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, if I want to spend more energy and also more time on writing, we call it write and verify, you write a few times, you could help get rid of some of these variations and make the variation much narrower. So those are all, again, device level tricks that's going to have implications on the circuit level and above. Now, besides that, actually, this analog cam, there's one thing we would like to, uh, to do, but it cannot do, is doing the best match or threshold match. You know, remember, I mentioned those two concepts. So um, our group then pushed a little further. The student actually think, can we, instead of doing the analog range-based match, can we do what we call multi-bit multi or multi-bit multi content addressable memory, we call it MCAM. And the answer, again, is yes. So what we do here is now each cell will store a, several distinguished states, dis, distinct states. So here I basically use each cell to store four states. Before it was two state, now it's four state. So if I then I would, for the query, I'll also be one of the states. Okay. So now the comparison will be between whether it, they are in the same state or not. If they're in the same state, we'll consider to be a match. If not, then it's not match. So again, uh, 
you can work out the example, the last line, every, every state is a match, so it's a match one, and the top one, is the, some of the cells, the red cells are not matched, so you get a large discharge current, and now you have um, that mismatch line for that one, okay? And again, this type of MCAM is also very useful in lots of interesting applications. There's some more interesting things about this MCAM. So besides doing the exact match, now we can, we can actually support the best and threshold match using this type of structure. So that's a good thing. And there's something even more interesting. You know, I mentioned that this matching, this comparison, it actually depends on the charge current. And it turned out that when you have different match, we call it matching distances, you actually have different discharge current size. This, the quantity of the discharge current is different. So if you can tell those differences, you're actually using that current to define what we call the distance functions, distance between the query and what is stored inside. And if I look at this, uh, there's a, this is a three-bit cell, uh, MCAM cell, and we use, this is a using a experimentally calibrated model to uh, do the simulation. And what I'm plotting here, if you just concentrate on this, this will be the conductance, or think about this as a current. And this is the, think about this as a query. So when your query come in, have different distances, I have a different current. And that, actually, you can see that it's a type of function a little bit like sigmoid-like function. If, uh, if some of you have been doing machine learning, you know sigmoid is a kind of interesting, nice little function to have, right? So now, if you recall back the TCAMs I showed you before, they're just bitwise comparison. That type of distance is called Hamming distance. So that's one type. But here, for the multi-state, I no longer measuring met, uh, Hamming distance anymore. I'm actually measuring a different distance. And this, I showed an example of sigmoid, but actually depends on where you bias the transistor, you can have different type of distance functions. And this is really, really interesting, right? So I could have, if I bias it at a certain range, I get sigmoid-like. If I bias it at another range, the like situation range, then then becomes squared Euclidean. That's also a very interesting functionality to, you, to have. So now by adjusting these biasing, biasing conditions, I actually get, I get, get different type of distance functions. Okay. So all of these eventually will be very useful at the application level. So now you start to see why I'm going this way, right? Different circuit designs gave me different type of matching functions, and different cell designs can give me different distance measurements, and eventually they will all play some role at the application level. Uh, again, we have worked with our colleagues uh, at uh, Fraunhofer in Germany, now actually testing this MCAM design idea on their real chip. And so this chip is, is that 28 nanometer high K metal gate uh, ferrofats I mentioned before, and what they have is just a bunch of uh, ferrofat and array, and then we can connect them differently to achieve the type of uh, CAM cells that I just discussed. Now after doing, uh, this is actually based on write verify. So if, I, if you look at this bottom line, I'm not gonna go into the details, don't want to uh, bury you with all details, but the key here, you see eight distinct lines. And that's basically tell me I have eight distinct states or eight distinct vo threshold voltage I can set it to. By setting these different threshold voltages, I got eight states, now I have, I, I have my MCAM cell, three bit MCAM cell, right? Then using, this is another interesting thing is, if you, you know, you all, when you try, when we design it, we actually have what we call a target threshold voltage. We want to set it to certain threshold voltage so we can get the best, we call it sensing margins. But in reality, when you do this, you don't necessarily always get that. So we have, actually, we, I'm showing here is the programmed one, the actual programmed one versus the uh, target one. So if you stare a little closer, you'll see that there are some differences. And then the question is, how serious are these differences? Uh, we actually did uh, some, uh, again, take it to the application level and look at the application level accuracy impact. Uh, now, this is a few shot learning, which is a learning, uh, learning model. But in this case, you can see that if I just compare the uh, experimental, mentally set uh, threshold voltage type of MCAM versus the theoretical one, and you can see that the accuracy loss is almost none. Okay. 
So again, this shows that even if you have a little variations, we can still tolerate that. So now let's, let's go a little further. Let's go to the application side and see what can these also really help us. And before I go there, I actually want to show you this immense big design space. I just used the Ferrofax as an example, but don't take it as Ferrofax is the god. There's lots of other devices you could use, RMs, MRAMs. If you're not in the device area, I know this kind of a little bit over your head, but think about they're using different materials, design different devices. But lots of these devices are, it also exhibit non-volatility, but they are a little different from Ferrofax in the sense they don't have this built-in control gate. They are not transistor-based. They are other things based. Um, anyway, uh, given all these devices, they can build you know, binary cams, T cams, multi-bit cams, I just introduced you, and there are different type of matching functions, and they can also be used to build analog cams, and they do another type of distance functions, uh, sorry, another type of matches, and they could even have different distance functions, like I said before. And all of these actually can find use in lots of the different uh, application areas. Graph processing, these attention networks for few shot learning, string matching, vector processing, H hyperdimensional computing, its decision trees, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'm going to do in the rest of the time, I'm going to use one example. But what I want to mention here is, you look at this from our design automation community, you see this is a huge design space. Okay? To explore that design space, really come up with really nice designs, you really need this, again, this cross-layer design approach. And if any of you are interested in playing with this uh, CAM type of concept, our group has a tool called Eva CAM and they are on the GitHub, so you're free to download it and try this. We already get quite a number of inquiries about our tool. And so again, I'm going to use this hyperdimensional computing and with a couple of the designs I have introduced to show you what are, you know, when you take into the application level, what other consideration, what other challenges you have to overcome. So the example, uh, like I said, I'm going to use hyperdimensional computing. This is a joint work with Moshe Imani at uh, UC Irvine. And if you don't know anything about hyperdimensional computing, don't worry about it. The key thing is hyperdimensional computing use a different way to learn or to encode information in order to do the learning. And the key person, the key uh, property of it is, is using very high dimension. What are we talking about? Thousands of dimension vectors to encode each data. So it's very high dimensional. That's why we call it high dimensional computing. By, you, by, doing, by encoding the data in that way, the learning becomes a little bit different. It's different from the uh, DNNs, which use gradient-based uh, learning. Here, the, gra the learning is based on more simple uh, ways. And it's because it's no gradient, and it's lightweight, it's very easy to do training. And besides, it also very robust because of this use of hyperdimensional data vector. Now, uh, hyperdimensional computing, of course, if you train it correctly, it can do lots of different tasks, you know, classification, reinforcement learning, et cetera, et cetera. Now, inside the hyperdimensional computing, in terms of algorithm, it basically contains three main steps. You need to encode the data into high dimensional data. Of course, you need the training, and then you need inference. Okay? And it turned out that training and inference, all of it is based on similarity search. So here, the search word, right? And again, similarity search, it map very well into the content addressable memories we talk about, okay? And that's why I'm going to use that to discuss this application. So one thing you always have to come back to think about is, just energy and latency is not enough. You have to think about the accuracy. So we actually first start with accuracy. So we look at these hyperdimensional vectors that with different, dimension, with different dimensions, and we look at the application level. So if you look at the top purple line, that's 8-bit GPU cosine similarity-based uh, cosine similarity-based search. So for training and uh, and uh, inference, the other three lines, green, blue, purple, and red. They are, the red one is for one bit TCAM, uh, blue is for two bit MCAM, and green is for a three bit MCAM. If I zoom in, you can see that at about uh, probably six, uh, six to six K to 10 K, that dimension size, the vector dimension size, the three bit 
the three bit uh, T cam, that should be, sorry, that should be, that should be M cam, that should be three bit M cam should be approaching the uh, accuracy of eight bit cosine similarity, cosine uh, similarity based search. Okay. The M cam, remember M cam is based on this intrinsic distance function that within the provided by the transistors. Okay. So this is really encouraging, right? And so that now they tell us that if I have a three bit uh, M cam with that unique distance function, I can actually approach this eight bit precision. Now I, we, we feel that this can actually, actually could be further improved if we do more what, more training or more better encoding. So getting into, so what does all this mean if you could do this with Ferrofats, with AMCAM? We actually compare the, uh, I, uh, in, in this case, we compare the energy, okay? So if, suppose everybody's trying to achieve the similar accuracy, call it accuracy, com, ISO accuracy comparison. At ISO accuracy, that this is the uh, GPU energy, you can see that uh, yeah, uh, so actually this is, not, uh, this is not a full value, this is just improvement. The uh, three bit M cam is here, okay? And then this is the two, I think this is the uh, T cam based, and this is CMOS based, and here's the Ferrofat. So you see that uh, by using um, this Ferrofat, we gained about 10x improvement. Now of course these, if you look at this, uh, compare the CMOS T cam, versus GPU, you can see that the architecture actually contributes a lot to this improvement, right? So uh, we like to do this because we want to understand the contribution, whether it's from, whether it's from uh, architecture, from circuit, or from your devices. I think if you, any of you work in this area, that's really important way to make sure you break down the benefits, you know where it's all coming from. Now so you say, okay, so you got about 10X, that's not that. That's not as impressive as I'd like to see. Now another story, of course, you could also look at it in another way. You say, if accuracy is really important to me, if everybody works at the highest accuracy they can, doesn't matter, you just work, you just put in as much devices, as much things you want, get me the highest accuracy one. So it turned out, you see that the, now the energy, if you compare the energy, we had a little different story because Ferrofats, the MCAM Ferrofats with three bed, I can actually achieve accuracy very similar to GPU, and now the improvement in energy is a lot higher, but then the other two in between here, they, don't, they just cannot get to that accuracy you need. Okay? So again, this is a, a story that you have to keep in mind. Let me go a little faster here. Now, so this is all good, but don't forget the variations. So think, I showed this graph before, there's variations on the devices, and what if you bring in this device, uh, variation? What does it mean on the accuracy? So here, again, it shows that with a three-bit uh, MCAM design, even with, the, uh, even with these uh, significant, uh, the, this is a sigma of variation, at, the, at below 100 millivolts of variation, we don't see a whole lot of uh, accuracy drop. Of course, as you get bigger, as variation get bigger, then actually the three-bit gets a lot worse. Okay. But in talking with the device people, when we understand that the variation should be within this range. So this is, this is again, tell us this is really a very promising direction. Now besides that, I want to bring another yet challenge, throw another wrench into this uh, group. Now that, that those accuracy plots I showed you, they're all at pretty high dimensions, so at least uh, 3,000 or 4,000 high uh, dimensions. Now it turned out that if you de design an array, an MCAM array that has uh, 3,000 dimensions, that's just not possible. Why? Because as your dimension here, I'm show what I'm showing is the number of mismatches per row. As this is only for 64 column array. As, my, as I increase the number of mismatches, mismatches, actually it's hard for me to tell the difference anymore. So sensing circuit becomes extremely hard to design, right? So that tells me that I cannot design really too big of an array. So what can you do now? You know, this is not, how can you still deal with high dimensional vectors, but with cameras much smaller, right? And what, how does that impact the accuracy and uh, energy and, and so forth? So one immediate uh, design that our group has recently come up is we simply, of course, we use the small dimension M cams and I'll use, 
kind of leverage from the high, high hierarchical uh, memory design structure. So we can use maths, we can use banks to construct these. But the key thing here is we need uh, what we have here then when we match, when we map the dimension, the high dimensional vectors, we basically stitch, you can think about each of these arrays basically represents a slice of the hyperdimensional vector, okay? Then you need to stitch the result together. How you stitch the result together is very important. And uh, the way we did at the simplest approach, we just use a majority vote. Whichever rows that get the most matching uh, points, That'll be the row I call it a, a, ma a best match. But it turned out that's not the, that's not the best solution. And you know, again, if you're interested, I can talk to you offline. So now then we design sensing circuit to help us to kind of stitch all the results together, okay? So here, then I show some more accuracy results. So again, if I look at this accuracy, this is the number of columns in camera arrays. So think about this is my cam camera array sizes. The max is I can build the largest I want. And these different color lines just means different dimensions of the uh, vectors. So again, if I have h relatively high dimensional vectors, the drop of the accuracy is not that significant. Then if I put all the encoding, training, inference all together uh, in terms of energy, we got about uh, you know, eight, 8x improvement uh, compared, sorry, 80x improvement compared to GPU. Now there's some more room to improve the data. The GPU's uh, technology node is actually much higher. It's 16, a uh, lot lower, 16 nanometer, but the cams we use is 22 nanometer. And also there's more hardware retraining can be done. So I use, let me uh, try to wrap up here fast. Um, sorry, oops. What did I do? Uh, now I, let me just back up a couple of more. <laughs> Press too fast. So what I have just showed you is using the FerroFed content addressable memory to show you some solutions for some interesting algorithm, for an interesting algorithm. And just really trying to see what is all these device circuit architecture together, what are the challenges we have, and what are the opportunities we have. Now, don't take it as this is the only in-memory computing. There's lots of other ones, right? There's general purpose CIMs where you do the logic or Boolean, uh, Boolean operations or arithmetic operation on the peripheral of your memories. You could also, you know, I also mentioned crossbars for matrix vector multiplications. And there's also a bunch of all these different choices of uh, devices. So you see that now, I'm just listing some more. And there's also architecture level uh, opportunities. How do you do all these different architecture designs you know, in, in terms of heterogeneous integration? And at the end, they have lots of impacts on lots of different applications. So uh, I just show you one example, but I think you can see that there's lots of opportunities to, ex to explore here. Let me just quickly, in three minutes, wrapping up, I just want to show one more thing, because otherwise my, my student is going to complain, why you didn't highlight my work? <laughs> so this is actually a work that's going to be presented by my student tomorrow uh, at the session. This is using this in-memory computing for recommendation system. Well, the reason I want to highlight this work is whatever I showed you before is all about content addressable memory, but there are other, you can stitch different type of in-memory computing kernels together to solve interesting problems. So you probably all either suffer or benefit from the recommendation systems, right? You collect something, then you got lots of recommendations. What's inside there, the two main things, that's if you, you query, and there's basically leveraging a big, huge database of all the people who have clicked, selected this type of things, they try to basically make a prediction of what you, you might like in the next time. And what they do is they basically use the filtering uh, technique to f pick the candidates, items that you could be interested in. Then they use a ranking technique to rank which one could have the highest probability you might click, you might want, you might want to have. So do filtering and ranking, okay? And if you look going inside a little bit more, basically it depends on two type of main, main two main type of uh, processing. One is processing the dense features features like you know, continuous historical data, continuous data, and the other one will be the, we call it embedding tables. These are dealing with sparse or categorical data, you know, kind of a demographic type of data. 
And these type of data now, it turned out that these dense features can readily exploit what we call the crossbar arrays, you know, matrix vector multiplication type of thing, because they are basically built on convolutional neural networks or deep neural networks. Now, for all these embedding tables, which has huge amount of data it has to deal with, lots of the memory wall problems, that actually can benefit from another type of uh, in-memory computing array. This particular in-memory computing array can do CAMs, configured to do CAMs, can be configured to do random access memory, can also be configured to do some very simple bitwise logic. So by using, by stitching all of these together, we actually can implement most of the major operations in recommendation systems. So you're welcome to attend her talk tomorrow. Uh, so what I just gave you is a, a little journey that our group has gone through from devices all the way to applications. And you show the different opportunities, challenges we have. And I don't think I need to say that more. I hope by now you are convinced this is definitely lots of opportunities there. But there are lots of challenges. And that's why I want to stand here to tell lots of you and especially the young people sitting down here, join the, join the effort. And there's lots more good problems to work on. I list out a few of them. Whenever you put in more things into the memory, you face a problem of balancing density and functionality. More functions, less density. Can we do better? Peripheral overhead. Uh, analog design, the sensing circuit, big challenges, right? Reliability, accuracy, trade-offs. Okay, where should these in-memory computing blocks be placed? DRAMs, caches, first level, second level, third level, all the way to storage, where do you put them? Different places have different choice, have different prices you have to pay, okay? Software is a big thing, programming effort. How do we do this modeling, you know, really take it to the software level so that people would like to use them without worrying about too much about the details of these devices and circuits. So that's kind of what I call, you remember my title of my talk is about in-memory computing from devices to applications. I just want to close my talk with another thing. You know, if you decide to work in this kind of cross-disciplinary uh, area, the cross-layer design, I just want to share my experience of doing this work. Uh, start with prepare yourself. Capability, I call it. Okay? Make sure you take some classes. You probably go, you hear in, my intro, in the introduction, uh, given by Jin Jun, that I started out working in real-time embedded systems. And now I'm working with a lot of devices. Why I can do this? One little secret is my undergrad is in semiconductor physics. So I kind of go all the way up and all the way down. So I definitely encourage people to go arm yourself with more uh, knowledge. And of course, collaboration. You saw I already identified lots of, uh, uh, lots of people I collaborated with. When you do collaboration, you have to keep in mind, I, I want to make OCs, so I say commendation. So appreciation, you have to appreciate people in the device level, in the circuit level, EDA field, higher level application, you have to appreciate all these different efforts. And that's how you can communicate well. And last but not least, communication. You really need lots of communication. This is not just, I design a new device, go do another circuit design. I design a new circuit, go do another application. That doesn't work. My experience, totally not going to work. You have to come, keep communication, keep open that channel, keep discussing. And actually, some of these works, it's all come out of discussing with the device people. Because we tell them, you know what? You can improve your device like this and this. And they go like, oh, I didn't know that's important. You guys want that. OK, now I've let me do it. So they also very appreciate that type of feedback. So that's kind of the last thing I want to tell you uh, about when you want to work in this cross-layer design, which is indispensable. With that, I want to recognize all the sponsors. Without them, I would not be able to do all this research. And also all my students, uh, some of them already graduated. Diane is going to start a new career in the University of South Florida. Some of them are close to graduate. And also lots of my uh, colleagues there and uh, my former students, of course. So with that, I thank you. And I can take some questions if I didn't use up all my time. <laughs> Any question from the floor? Yes, step hey. up and. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon, for a very nice talk. Thank Nick Dodd from UCI. Um, you talked about uh, the effect of process variability in FE RAMs. Can you speak to the effect of temperature variability in the field? So, if you're deploying these systems in various uh, 
you know, geographic locations, you might see very extreme variations in temperature. And would that affect, for example, the bit level uh, representations in terms of not just the quality, but the ability to store fewer or more? Oh, yeah, of bits? yeah, definitely. And, and very how, good. Would, how would you design systems to account for that? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a very excellent, that's an excellent question, Nick. Um, temperature variation of ferrofats are very actively studied area. I think we have some colleagues in Georgia Tech actually working exactly on tech temperature variation modeling. And so for us, I think the way we think about it is if I need to, when I'm when I, in the field, when I have variations, I need to make sure that variation, I can still sense it within the sensing margin. So what we do is we use that type of modeling to define what is the sensing margin I really need to have given the temperature range I'm going to face in the field. So I think there's also opportunities, I know you work in this area, there's also opportunities to think about dynamically control, or dynamically compensate this type of variation. What can we do there? I think that's still open field. So first off, Sharon, thank you so much. This is a great talk. I learned so much. You're, you know, this is a, a great presentation overall. Thank and you. a very important thank, area. Thank you. Thank you. My question, I'm going back to the uh, part where you were talking about how this works in technology and, and I keep thinking about this, uh, this idea that it's still working on this notion of a pre-charge and then you discharge, mm. right? And when you learn about cam cells, if, you know, you talk about, yes, we know this t uh, uh, dissipates a lot of power and it's due to two parts, the very large device sizes. If you think SRAM, right? Lots yeah. of devices, so this, is power hungry, but also to the fact that you're pre-charging and always just charging, yeah. except for one line, yeah. right? Yeah. This takes up a lot of energy, and so this still seems to be happening, although you have some variation because now you can also do this thresholding. Is this, a st is this still a problem? Is this something you're working on? Um, is there a way to do it differently, like a pre-discharge that you only uh, uh, pull up the line that matches instead? You yeah, about that. great, 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 great question, Iris. Um, so again, because it's cross-layer, I'm going to answer your question also in a cross-layer fashion. So what you mentioned, can we design, in a sense, can we design the circuit a little differently? Instead of pre-charge and discharge, can we do the, you know, selective, basically use the charging as, so that we don't waste that energy? Because every time we pre-charge, that's all the energy, and then lots of it will get dissipated. Uh, that, we try to work on that somewhat. The price of that would probably be on the latency side. Right. Yeah, so, uh, that, so that's a circuit level. Can we do better than that? I think that's still open. And another thing that this, this definitely is still a big problem, the, the power consumption. So another way to think about in the cross-layer fashion is we are actually start thinking about looking at the algorithm side. Can we, you know, since we cannot build huge arrays anyway, we're going to build small arrays, but can we selectively turn on certain arrays? So then look at the algorithm itself, some approximation algorithm, actually, we could even leverage some of these, um, say, uh, we call it hierarchical, um, no, maybe, let me go to, probably some of them might know, uh, some of you may know this PCA principal component analysis. So think about that type of things that actually trying to zoom in, gradually zoom in to the critical data you need. So then we, can, we might put in a couple of more of these arrays, but we only selectively turn on one array, then that array tell us what are the next bunch of arrays we can turn on. So that'll help us in terms of reducing the energy. But of course, again, you pay the price of latency. So like open problems. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Very nice talk. Rajiv Joshi from IBM. Thank you. <clears throat> um, you know, there are a lot of uh, these memories, right? Mm. Volatile and non-volatile, mm. which are explored for in memory computation. Mm. Uh, in volatile memories, we know the disturb is a very much an issue, mm. while in non-volatile, it's all these variation mismatches yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, fluctuations and those kind of things. Which technique you think, or which memory style, 
you think would be the most successful uh, to be used in, in, uh, in memory computation? That's, um, that's a really, <laughs> that's a big high level question. I, I, you know, I think at this point, I would say first jewelry is still out there, but to me, I think we probably still going to be living in a more heterogeneous area in the sense of certain type of memory technology might be good for at certain levels, you know, certain things, and some others will be good at certain, at another level, some other things. So I, I, I don't think at this point that I would say one technology going to dominate all the in-memory computing area. So I, let me give you one example. One thing I didn't mention is these ferrofets. They're really good in terms of you know, compact and all that. One thing at least at this point, writing takes time and takes more energy than CMOS. So now if I have, let's say, if I need to keep change the content inside my ferrofet cams, then that might not be a good idea to use it if you have to change it every couple of cycles, you have to rewrite it again. But then CMOS could be a lot better. So in that sense, the depending on your applications, duty cycles or patterns, you might even choose the different technologies. So I, I don't, I don't feel like there will be one technology going to dominate all the IMC space. Okay. I'm sure there might be other people who disagree. And we can have a panel maybe next year. We can discuss this. Thank you. I'm of the same opinion. Thank you. OK. Yep. So no, de no debate at this point yet. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thanks for your very nice, nice talk. I'm Philippe. I'm a PhD student from Telecom Paris uh, in France, hmm? part of the Young Fellows Program. Oh, great. And I have two questions, actually. The first one is if this kind of memory and uh, in memory computing is useful for safety critical systems because a lot of things are still done on the bus and a lot of like memory regulation bandwidth is done on the bus and the communication between cores in the memory mm -hmm. like bandwidth regulation mm -hmm. and since you lose like a lot of things in the memory controller and on the bus could you use that kind of solution in this kind of mixed mixed criticality real-time systems mm. and my second question is related to security like if you if there is research concerning which kind of like side channel attacks does this open right if there are any possible exploitations coming from this type of approach excellent questions uh, Patrick you definitely picked the right people to come to this young fellows program <laughs> excellent question so your first question about uh, whether this can help safety critical systems especially in terms of uh, mixed criticality so I take that as the timing you're thinking about right you is that kind of thinking about yeah, the exactly. timing you have lots of variations yeah, exactly. in timing um, that's a that's a very good question I haven't gave a deeper thoughts on that I think in terms of doing the in-memory computing, if you could limit the amount of variations in the execution time, then they would help the mix, type of mixed mix criticality problems. But that, I think, still needs to think about what type of algorithm can map to these type of in-memory computing uh, fabrics. And uh, if it can map it well, and it doesn't suffer, you know, you, you don't have to build this very sophisticated memory hierarchies and also reduce the, the data transfer, then I think this will be helpful. Yeah, so very insightful question. Your second question, uh, let me see, your second question. Uh, it's about side channel. Yeah, side possible. channel, okay. That's, a, that's also a very interesting question. So we, well, our group actually used these in-memory computing uh, to design a, to design AES-like type of encryption, encrypto engine. And we feel that it, because it's in memory, and then when you do your encryption or decryption, this type of in-memory computing actually is very nice because it reduces the power variation, also reduces the kind of the cache timing type of variation. So we think on side channel, it definitely should have some interesting uh, benefits there, and we're actually working with Professor Sri Paramaswanan sitting down there in his group trying to really look at this, see how effective, can we, can we really quantify it in terms of the um, side, power, side channel, power side channel. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, 
Max, thank you for your presentation. And uh, 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 my question is about the limit of the computing. Can you speak a little louder? Yeah, oh, <laughs> my question is about could you uh, predict the limit of the processing memory, uh, such like uh, the uh, flexibility or something? Because even we uh, optimize the, the uh, processing memory structure, it, it will have a limit. Uh, the speed, the performance, and, uh, and uh, could you predict the limit of the processing memory? Uh, when you say limit, the limit yeah. in terms of uh, scalability or device yeah. scalability or uh, architecture or circuits? I, I Everything, because uh, uh, there is a level here. We, we cannot uh, exceed the level, right, uh, such like the, the scalability of the chip, we cannot uh, make it smaller than the size of the icon or, or something, yeah, mm -hmm. right? So what is the limit of the processing in memory? I mean. uh, uh, let me try. <laughs> I, I think the, from the device scalability point of view, especially for these FerroFast and others, you know, even RMs, they, just like CMOS, they will have some scalability limits at the end, yes. and that'll be, you know, maybe going down to a couple of nanometers is going to be a challenge. One thing is I talk about the non-volatility. When you scale the device to too small, the non-volatility might not be there anymore. Also, the memory window become much smaller, and the sensing win sense margin becomes smaller. So there is, there should be a limit there. Yes. Now, in terms of this whole in-memory computing paradigm, I actually don't feel that well, there will be a limit. Actually, I think what it is is as we get closer and closer to the device, the traditional device conventional scaling limit, I think all these architecture level techniques will actually take off. They will actually have more opportunity to shine in a sense of because we just cannot do, we just cannot write this more law curve anymore. We have to do more innovation. I think was it on yesterday's uh, keynote that this point also point out, right? That DTCO, the design and technology co-optimization is now already taking 50% of the whole you know, scaling trend. So I think the in-memory computing, I feel is only will gain more popularity. Like I said, this has been there 30 some years ago when I even was a grad student or after I graduated. Uh, but now it's getting, you know, people are more interested in it, why? It's because of the challenge in to keep writing on that Moore's law curve. So I, I definitely feel there's a lot more things that in-memory computing can be done, can, can, can help. Okay, thank you very much. I hope I answered your question. Any, any further questions? This is great. Patrick, that way, five extra points for you guys. <laughs> all right. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Hu for her wonderful presentation. Thank you all.